<laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks for showing up uh, and uh, um, coming to uh, see the talk. And, uh, and I also want to give a sh shout out to uh, the folks organizing for SF Scala. Oh, sorry. For folks organizing a SF Scala, uh, thanks as well. And also to Chart Boost. So today we're going to be talking about a, uh, a, a technique for, for building expression DSLs using using a number of category theory concepts with with Kleisley sort of being the star of the show. So let's, um, I, I guess I should, prob I should probably give like a, a quick introduction myself where, um, so I, I actually, I'm, I'm working for, for Verizon on the OnQ team right now, working on uh, infrastructure services for the video platform that we have there. And and we're, we, we do a lot of, uh, we do a lot of work using uh, pure pure functional programming principles, which is which which I'll be getting into on this on this uh, talk. So, so what we're what we're actually looking and doing is we're talking about building a an expression DSL such that uh, you have you have any type of input on any any kind of domain, and you could actually you you have you have your expressions compose and, and it can actually compute results based off of them and and it's actually it's it's a by reasonable I I actually I mean that in the uh, with with all, all the on a, all the connotations attached to that in fact where you have you have trans you have a referential transparency where you could actually wherever you have the expression at any place within your code it's always going to generate the same results and you won't have any side effects so that's that's really uh, that's really context of what we're doing here. So let's say we we want to actually compose a, an expression, and this is sort of a notational embellishment right here. I'm not I'm not saying that the adapter is taking x as input and outputting x. That's just an expression saying, okay, we have some adapter that's returning this value. So we have this returning Shostakovich or this returning five. And we're comparing the length of that, adding them together, and comparing it against 47. And by adapters, I mean any type of data source where data is actually being pulled from. It could be from a database. It could be from APIs. And the idea being that you could actually have errors be generating from these sources. So we want a way to build expressions so that as you as you uh, as you uh, if you apply them to different sources where data is coming from, you you could actually handle all the the error reporting. So, for example, you have an expression like this where kaboom is returned and snap is returned less than 47. You would have you would have uh, all your 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 error conditions return this result. Or you could have expressions where errors might be generated by the expressions themselves. Like in this case, you have a divide by zero. So, so we're going to be we're going to be building an an expression library using that that supports different types of operations, unary, binary operations. We're we're going to have our error handling completely separated from the core logic. That that's a key thing. And once again, we're we're being completely agnostic from where the data is originated from, hence the adapter, the adapter notation as I was showing before. So we have to handle these error conditions, and and yeah, so that's that's what we're after. Now we'll be using tools of Kleisley or the tools of category theory of Kleisley being one of them, and we're going to be talking about how you would build this library of operations and, and actually compose operations together to build these expressions. And here is a sort of like a sort of a notational way you can think about where you have values from the different adapters being gathered together and you have a result that's computed. So here's sort of an example expression uh, DSL that we're going to be putting together tonight. Now, as you can see here, we have we have an expression composed of symbols, where we say x to the n plus y to the n, the triple compare because we're going to be defining that as part of our DSL, is 
equal to z to the n and n is greater than two. And you pass this map into it and then the result's computed. Now, does anybody want to hazard a guess about what, what's going to be returned here? It's gonna always be the same value. It's gonna be a false, always, no matter what input you have here. Because this is Fermat's last theorem. Or it's a, it's a uh, according to Fermat's last theorem, there, there will never be a case where that'll hold. So that's just, that's just an example for this. So, so let's, let's take a step back and look at higher order functions in a general sense. So we have probably the simplest form of a high, higher order function, a perform where you pass in a function, you apply it to a value, you have, we have two, two very simple functions here. We have one that bumps a value up by one and one that splits in half. And you can compose them together where you say, okay, well, we're gonna split it first and then take that result and then bump it. So you get a four, or, or sorry, you get a three from the value four. And which means the same thing as this, it's just that's why you'll, it's a lot of more folks will use and then because it reads a little bit more, more smoothly. So this is how you would compose functions in a, in a very uh, straightforward functional sense. However, there is there's one thing missing there is that is all your values that are computed, they're, they're, there's no particular rules that can be, that can be applied to them. They're, it, it, it's pretty much, you know, you have, you have your input type and your output type and there's no real laws or any patterns that apply to that at all. It's just, these are just, just straight up functions. Well, we're gonna actually look at the definition uh, of, of a monad. And, and you'll, you'll see how this fits together in a moment. So, so I, I want to just, just show right here, I mean, if you were to open up Scala-Z's definition for a monad, you would, you'd see a lot of other methods in there. Uh, it turns out that these are really the ones that, the ones that you need to define a monad. And just so I can just do a quick run through of you know, what, what those methods mean. So you first have a point, the point operation. And all that does is lifts a single value into the form of a monad. So you have like an option where you say sum five, okay, that lifts that five into the form of a monad. And then for a sequence, you could actually, you, you lift a five in a sequence and you have now a sequence of one element. And in these cases, there are, there are empty cases where you get, at, the, the base case would be none for option int and for sequence it would be an empty, empty sequence. And, right, so that, that, that's a point operation. And now there's bind, which actually is known in Scala as, as flat map. And what that does is it transforms values from type A to B while at the same time lifting them and, and, and combining them into a single, single collection. And you have an example of this right here where you say, okay, we have some value and we do a flat map on, 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 on the, um, for, for, for the value in, in, inside of it. And, and what happens is you don't, you don't end up with the sum of a sum of the length, you end up just the sum of the length at the end, which is the sum of 12. And the work, same works for a sequence. So that's really kind of the idea of monads. It's about, it's about consistency, creating patterns for how you, how you contain data and how you, and how you uh, compose data together. And this, this could be really argued as, as the, one of the main, you know, pretty much the building blocks for pure functional programming. Now, I'm just going to do a quick comparison of what happens if you, you know, how, what's what's a world where you have monads and when you, and and when you, and where you don't? So say you have like an example here where you define a string as a uh, option of string, uh, a, a m, and you have a, and then we have say the same same thing down here, b and b of m, or b m. Well, if you're if you're if you want to map, map it to the length using, using, uh, using the monad form, it's, it's that simple. Whereas here, if you have to, uh, if, you don't, if you're not using monads, you check the null. So you have this conditional error. It doesn't read as, read as easily. And as you, com as you deal with more, uh, more pieces of data trying to compose them together, it's really simple here, just a flat map if you're talking about 
combining to. Here you have, you know, these these, these four different paths because you know two mon monads being used there. So this is a very simple example, and you can see right away that it's it's that that using monads as a as a uh, as a principle, it actually allows you to um, allows you to compose different pieces of your code together uh, using in, in uniform ways. And that also involves, I mean, you have the different monad laws that, that apply there. Uh, and, you know, involves identity and, you know, then I, 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 it's a little bit out, out I, I'm not going to be getting too deep into the theory of, uh, the category theory of laws right here, but, but that's, a, that's a part of a, that's how you, you get the consistency for composing different objects. So let's say you have a function right here where you have a to m of b. Well, this, it turns out that this, when you actually lift this, this actually is what a Kleisley is. And it's literally a function where you're mapping, it's, it's, it's a it's where you're mapping from an A to a monad of some to some type B. And that's that that's all Kleisley is. You can think of it as a function that has a that has a uh, that's you know that's been sort of blessed as a as a monadic uh, uh, data type. Now I, I just since I keep talking about Kleisley, I figured I'd put this slide up here so folks that know what Kleisley is. Yes, sorry. So does M have to be a monad there or just or can that be any type of structure? To do like the different composition operations, um, you have to uh, you'll you'll find that you'll need you'll need to have the monad type like within scope like you didn't like you're composing different monads together or d different uh, Kleisleys together I should say so you'll find that there's some there's some methods in in uh, the 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 Scala Z where you actually need to have it defined as a monad and I'll show an example of defining one later on yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So he was asking if it, this needs uh, if this needs to be a mon if M needs to be a monad in order for for this to work, and you can actually you you could define some Kleisleys where it's not a monad, but you'll find for certain operations, if there's no implicit monad monadic type for for it in scope, you'll find in certain operations, uh, you know, you, you'll see a compiler error saying, okay, well, there's there's no it's not in scope. You can't you know you have to define one of these. So, so the answer is, yeah, if you want to do all the different composition operations, um, you need to have one defined in scope. So, and for the example DSL that we're constructing, I'll show an example uh, monad defini monadic definition. And so, yeah, so once again, this is, uh, so this, uh, Kleisley wasn't, he didn't actually invent Kleisley's himself, but he's done work, uh, that's related to type theory, and he actually. Um, so, so Kleisleys are actually named after him. So I just had to throw this slide up here. So now we're going to build the expression DSL. <laughs> now, here is for for our language that we're constructing. We have this notion of a term, and a term. Think of term as in terminal value. So it can be. It's think of it as like either the input into a into uh, into an expression or the output, all right. And it could it, it could be an error condition. Doesn't necessarily have to be. So we're we're defining right here. That, so this is a definition of a term right here. You'll notice that we have this diamond operator that I'm defining in different places. This this comes in handy later on for expressing binary operations. So you would have like say a term of e diamond f that that is a, a term of a binary operation where those are the left and right operands. And so, so very, very simple definition, just contains a value. And the term monad is, here's how you would define a monad. We're defining the two point and bind operations. We're saying, okay, we want to lift a value into a monad. You just simply create a new term and set the value to you know, what you're actually lifting into uh, you know, the value lifting into the monads. That's the point operation, very simple definition. And then we have the bind operation, which actually it takes in a term A, and then it takes a function that goes from A to term of B. 
And once you have those two, well, okay, we just need to take, we take f and the, the function from a to term of b, and we just take the value out of term a and then just pass it to f. That's it, that's bind. So once you define both of these, you, it's, it's, now, it's now a monadic data type, and you can you know, do maps, flat maps, and, and such. I, sh I should say, strictly speaking, map, map is actually uh, a requirement for, for functors. Which is a which is a super uh, a which is a um, monad is a type of functor. So yeah, I'll try I'll try to inject category theory here in in, in doses where it, where it applies. Um, so we have so we have a few term definitions. It's an integer and a string. So the very if you could define Boolean, you can define complex numbers. You can yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I had a question for the previous slide. All right. <clears throat> Yep. Is there a separate definition for the greater than and less than as a type? Uh, you mean a greater, less than? Oh, for for this right here, you're saying? Yeah. Is there a type with the same name? So this well, right here. Yeah. So there, there's actually yeah. Elsewhere, I, I've defined a case class. Right. So I've defined a case class that represents the left and right operands. Honestly, I can't remember if that's in the slides or not, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so I've defined a type, the, the diamond type, that sort of contains the, uh, the, the operands for binary operation, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so we can define any, any types of terms that you want to use here. Now let's say, right, actually here it is, okay. So this is, this is a, the, the, the definition, <laughs> this is a definition right here. So, you could literally pass a tuple. Now I could have just expressed this as a tuple, but for as you see later on in the code, it would get really a little bit, little bit hairy to have uh, the, the, to have the tuples everywhere. The diamond notation actually does help a lot. This microphone is kind of it seems like a certain angle. It's louder. I don't know. Um, so here is an example of a Kleisley. So we have a. We're, we're actually adding some a capability here to a Kleisley operation right here, where term is a monad, and we're, we're start, it's, a, it's a function going from A to B. And what we want to do, this is pretty much expresses what we want to do here. We want to say, okay, we have a Kleisley A from M of B on the left hand, and Kleisley of A of M to B on the right hand, and we want to combine them and make that a Kleisley of A to M, a B diamond B. So this is how you would do that. It's actually quite straightforward. I mean, you're, you're just defining your Kleisley like this. You say, OK, well, my output that I want is a Kleisley from A to B diamond B. And the input is on left, right, just as it shows up there, from A to B, A to B. And the way you compose it is you're saying, OK, you're lifting a function into a Kleisley. So your input into a function would be type A. And we're, so we're going to apply, we're going to apply a to the left side and the right side, and, and, and diamond them together like that. It's that simple. So it's as you might, as you might guess, composing one of these things. So now we're going to build a a library of our operations here. And I have a few type definitions just to sort of just sort of as a shorthand for them. So we have like say an operation that, with no faults, and by no faults I mean that okay, this operation does not uh, return any, does not uh, generate any errors. But it may, there may be errors coming from different sources. So well, we'll get more, more on that later. But operation with no faults would be defined as a term with in some input and some output. An operation with faults would be a term, input, and a and a a fault error condition or the output. So this is this is the disjunction. This is actually uh, skull is the disjunction type, which is a uh, it's a way. Uh, it's similar to the Scala either, but it's right bias. So meaning, if you were to do like a map or a flat map on the Scala Z disjunction, it would actually say, okay, it would it, it would. It would apply to the right-hand side. So if you actually had an error condition and you did a map on it, it would just pass right through. Can I think of it as like an option. If you were to do a map on option, it's like like none. Think of it that way. So that's so this would be an operation with faults has some error condition. 
Now we have a binary operation, so it'll be like, okay, a term, and once again, we have a Boolean, diamond, Boolean, and then Boolean is a result. So, so those are the different type definitions, and defining these things is pretty straightforward. You're just saying, okay, define not L. I'm just, uh, you know, define the Kleisley there. Uh, Boolean term is, actually that's an object that's defined there. I don't think there's a slides where fr fr this will actually create the term from the Boolean, from the Boolean value, that, that's all that is. And then map not L, so you're just, or not uh, the value. So yeah, that's not, and and is, is like this. So defining your library functions is really a simple matter of just, you know, just listing them out. And there's some neat things we can do, like you have a compose K right here, where you have like say a function where it's like, okay, here's add, it just adds them together, okay? Subtract is simply, is simply an add, but you're negating the right hand side. So I'm just doing a Kleisley composition of add in this function right here. That's what compose K is. So pretty straightforward. Division's a little, is different because this is an operation with faults. This operation may actually generate an error condition. And right here we're saying, okay, well if it's zero on the right hand side for, of the input, we're going to say, by the way, this minus before versus minus after, these are, these are uh, disjunction definitions where you're saying, okay, this, uh, this is on the left side and this is on the right side. So all these symbols seem, seem kind of, Kind of odd at first, but as you start using them, it, it, it makes sense. It's sort of, they're, they're kind of, they're actually quite visual. So you, you get used to them and after a while you don't really, they, they don't seem awkward anymore. They're actually a lot better than just writing out like a long name that, you know, that you might see like, you know, other, other languages or other libraries. So, so this is how you define division right here. And, and here is an exponential function right there. So building your library is, it's really quite simple, and you know this once again, we're not being concerned at all about errors coming from data sources. We just build a library to our, we, we, just, we can just add different uh, op operations to our library as we need them. Now, I want to give a quick, sort of a quick side, uh, side sort of a sidebar here. Uh, you could actually use Kleisley in place of dependency injection. And I would say a good example of that would be to take a look at the implementation of uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the funnel project that we have is open source um, for under uh, on queue GitHub uh, open source project, uh, or sorry, uh, open source um, library that we have. And we, we actually make, we make a lot of use of Kleisleys for this purpose. And you can think of it as, okay, you have a Kleisley defined and you can actually inject your functionality here. And it's, it's surprisingly effective and a lot, a lot, lot cleaner and, and more, more, uh, more approachable than using like, say like the, the cake pattern, for example. So, so now I'm gonna show how we handle error, can, uh, handle error conditions. And this is actually quite, this is quite interesting because what we want to do is we have our library full of operations that do not, that, that assume that there's no errors coming in. They may generate some errors, some operations, but none of them receive errors. Well, we need to, we, we basically what we want to do is as we're building our expressions, we want to take the different operations that we're, that we're composing together to form these expressions and sort of wrap some, wrap some error handling capability around them separately from the operations so we can fit them together and have an expression where if there's an error at the very beginning at, at sort of the, uh, the leaves of, of your expression, then what will happen is it will actually, they'll be routed through to the top of the expression you have that is your end result. So you'd short circuit evaluation of, of the different operations. It would just, uh, you'd have all your errors gathered at the end of the, uh, uh, evaluation of the expression. So this is, and this is how we achieve that. We have sort of a unary through operator, which is for unary operations. And what we're saying is, okay, we have a library operation that goes from A to B, but you know what? We may have errors coming into it and we have to allow errors to, to be coming out of the operator. So 
and you'll you'll see why I use these symbols later. They they make sense as I as I'm putting them together. But for a unary operation, here's the library. The library operation is going to be passed in here. It's going from A to B, and the the output is going to be is actually going to be um, it's actually uh, it's actually going to be of this of this type right here, where once again, yeah, it's a, the terms of monad. You have errors or a value, or errors or a value. And this is this is actually how you you do that. And it's it's really quite straightforward. All you all you're doing is as you have your input coming into the function, you convert the disjunction to an option. And if there's a value there, it's not an error condition, then you're actually going to say, okay, this is a value that we could pass to our, our expression, which is our library function right here. And we can get the result for that. If we have the result, we map it and say, okay, it's a successful value. But if we have an error condition, this, this yielded nothing, then we're gonna go on the else side, and we have to take the, create a disjunction left side, saying it's an error condition. And the way to do that is we have to take A with a disjunction and swap it in order to get at the, the error and actually return that. So that's, that's why I say A swap head, because in order to refer to the error, you have to, you're, it's right biased, so you can only get, get the right side of this thing. So we have to swap it so we can get the error side of it and return it as an error condition. And that's, that's, that's it right there for handling for unary operators. For, for binary operators, it's very, very similar. The difference here is now you have, you have the case where you have on both the left, left and right hand side, you have to deal with. So that's why it's the same idea here where you're actually getting, you're converting the disjunctions to options, and only if you have both of them, you can pass them to the, to the operation right here. And then you have the same, same sort of thing here. This is a bit more complicated because you have, once again, we have, uh, I mean, it's a binary operation. And we're, we're saying, okay, we're mapping if it's successful. We have to do a left map on this. This means you're, lefting, you're mapping the left-hand side, the error side, and you're mapping it to a non-empty list. This is really only needed to, to have the, the types line up correctly. Generally, when you're doing a map like this, when you do a map like this on, on the right side, it means that it's successful. So that's really just sort of the, for the for type plan, the, the, the uh, you know, once again, getting the types correctly there. And then you do a getter else. And you just simply, this combines all the errors together. We're doing the swap again on this, see? And we combine errors and uh, reduce and append them together. Now, by the way, I, I, I forgot to mention the non-empty list. This is a nice feature built into Scala-Z that represents a list, as, as, as it sounds, it's a list that is guaranteed to have at least one value in it. And this is very, this is, very helpful spe specifically for error conditions. I'm sure many of you have seen where you have like some API, some annoying API return to say, oh, there's, there's errors here, and then you look at the list of errors and it's empty. So then what does that mean? That's ambiguous. It doesn't, you know, maybe there wasn't errors, I just don't know what they were, or there was no errors. I mean, you don't know. With this, you could actually guarantee, have the type system guarantee that you have a list with at least one one element inside of it. So it's actually used a lot for, for uh, error conditions. So, okay, so now we've handled errors. We can, let's, let's, put the, let's have a nice little representation of an expression here, where we say, okay, an expression from input to output is really the same thing as an expression input to non-empty list of false or the output. So I have this nice type definition or a trait, I should say, that defines, okay, here's an expression, and it has a Kleisley inside of it. You could pass, pass a value into it, because remember, it's Kleisley as a function, so you can evaluate it like this. And then you have, you could define your expression there. So that's kind of a handy, you'll see that used later on, yes? Right. And on the two list, but that's assuming that the input succeeds. Um, are you doing that as a uh, So this is a, uh, oh, okay. Because that you're saying here that the input might fail. Right. Yeah, I forgot, so I forgot to mention, there's one other thing that's different about this binary version, is that the unary version assumes, that's why I named the symbols the way they're named, is that I'm saying, okay, 
This is for operations that may not generate any, that will not generate errors, okay? This is for operations that may generate errors. That's why this is there. Is that your question? On th this slide right here? Okay. Why, why have what again? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, if your input, oh, okay, uh, this, this is assuming, right, so this is, yeah, this is with, used within a context where you don't have, you don't have failures on the input. Um, yeah, but I, 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 I actually, that's a good point. I see what we are getting at. The, the, the context where I've used this is where it's, it's an expression that doesn't, that you have like a fixed input value already. So it's usually used later on in the chain where you've already gathered the, the values from the sources. But the, yeah, that, that, I see, it makes sense. So, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that, in this expression, you'll see it used later on. So, um, so now we're gonna look at composing these things. There's a number of composition operators. I'm just showing like an excerpt. This is from the Scala Z source, by the way. There's a few operations here. There's an and, then, and compose. And you could, you could just by looking at the type signatures, you can see what's going on. I mean, literally, you're going from a, an A to M of B. And we say, okay, we have an arc Lysley of M of B to C. So your result is going to be a Kleisley of M from A to C. So you're composing those together. That's what this is. And, and then the sort of does the reverse of that. And actually, this, this answers your question that you were asking before. Why, what, why do we need to have like this monad defined? It's actually a bind that you need to be defined, which is a super, super type of monad. And that implicit has to be in scope in order for this operation to work. So you could just define bind and then, and then you would you would have you would have what you need, which is just uh, the bind method. So, uh, so yeah, so this is so these these would be some operations for composing composing Kleisley's, uh together, and we're going to use this right here. Let's say we have an integer expression. It's a so we take we have a we d define it, it takes as an input a Kleisley up here. Now we have different operations. So we're, we're defining our DSL syntax is what we're doing right here. We're saying, okay, we're gonna define the different operations. And from this, you could actually, you could see how the through operators sort of fit into this picture. You, you take a library operation, you pass it through the, through the, through unary, and that, that adds the error handling around the operation. And then you compose it with K. Same thing, same thing here. Um, and of course, we're using the other composition right there. And you notice that we're using different versions of this, like this one right here, this is for division, which may generate errors. That's why we're using the other version of this. And then here's the one for, uh, for uh, um, binary operation that doesn't generate errors, but it you know, could receive some from the source. So these are different operations that you can compose. So we're, we're now building the syntax for our DSL here. So we're actually quite close now. We have, we have all the plumbing that we need for the error handling. We have, we have a, a way of defining these library operations and composing them together. But we don't have any real means of mapping our, our actual language to these concepts. We have these symbol definitions here. I mean, what, what do these symbols mean? Uh, how, so there, there's kind of some pieces that we actually have left to implement. Yes? I actually have a question about, uh, I think it was two slides ago, there was oh, a okay. comment at the bottom about uh, applicative. So, so right. bind, bind is about monads, but what I've seen so far in yeah. the code only s seems to require applicative. Could this work with applicative or is there something yeah, actually need that, it, it, So he's asking, he's asking if this could be, if we could use applicatives here. In particular, you mean validations, right? Which is a type of applicative. And the answer is yes. And I'm actually going to show a version of this using applicatives and so you can sort of compare and see the difference. But yeah, exactly. 
Um, you could use implicatives in place of, of disjunctions. But, uh, but yeah, I mean this, so continuing with the construction using disjunctions, we are almost there, but we're missing, we're actually missing a few pieces. We have to have some way of uh, ex defining where we're getting our input from. We have to have some sort of adapters as I'm referring to them. We have to, we have to consider, you know, okay, how are we, how are we handling these errors there at sort of at the, at the edge of edge of the world of our, you know, purely functional system. So this is sort of the interface with the outside world that we have to implement now. And this would be now for our simple DSL, we're using a map as input. I mean, reality, you'll probably you you'll probably have like a database connection, you have like uh, API or something, but we have just a simple map here. Now it's a map from symbol to any, and so I know it's probably. It's, I mean, it's any, that, that's, you know, it's any type, so it's not, or, or any value, so it's really not um, uh, the most type safe thing in the world. But remember, we're at the edge of the world where we're getting values from somewhere we not, don't know what the type is. So right here you would define, you could define, say, okay, we're taking a symbol, and using the symbol, we're pulling the value out of the map. That's all this is right here. And, re and returning them as specific types, casting them to different types. So if there's an actual error condition, it will be, the, uh, the error condition will be actually trapped right here. And this is, this is actually a, the Scala Z uh, try catch block is what this is. This is a much nicer, much nicer than the one that's built into Scala in that what you can do here is you can actually say, okay, you could pass a, you could do some, do something here, and here we're just casting to type T, and you could actually, it will actually return a disjunction, which you can actually, um, you can you can handle in any any other disjunction. Right here, we're doing a left map, saying we're mapping the error side and converting the exception to a message. So a really really elegant way to handle error conditions, and that's that's exactly what this does. And all these return either an error condition, left side, or the actual value. So that's our adapter, pretty straightforward. Um, we need to have a way of, we, we need some actually some implicit definitions so that, okay, uh, we could take a symbol and, and in our language say, okay, this is an integer, this is a double, this is a string. Because you know, edge of world. Once again, we don't we don't have actual type information on that. So this is sort of the e point where 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 types come into play, and it's really as simple as you're defining you're defining your classes like this. It's using the adapter functions that were on the previous slide, as int, as double, as string. So it's using that adapter code. This is a sort of a convenience right here, so that when you're actually passing your input into your expression. You don't have to wrap it yourself with the adapter. It'll, it'll actually just say, oh, okay, you got a map of that. Well, that's really the adapter with the input in it. And then here, this is for constants. So you want a constant value. You don't have to do anything special there. You'd like to have it converted to an expression for you, and that's what this does. So now, this will actually work after from all the code that I showed. This will this will actually work, and you could actually. You can have any kind of expression that you want here, any kind of input, error hand, or errors are handled as you'd expect them to. Now we're going to go back and to look at how we could make some changes and use applicatives. And the definition, and the idea here is that, well, may I should first explain what I mean by, you know, by applicatives or specifically validations. So a validation, is like a, unlike a disjunction, you could actually gather multiple errors together. And that's, that's what applicatives are about. It's about combining multiple values and sort of doing, doing uh, handling data in parallel. That's kind of the way, way to think of how, uh, what an applicative is. And a validation is a type of applicative in that it's, the notation is a, where you have, okay, on the left side, this is your faults, and on the right side is your value. Now, validation NEL means non-empty list. So I could have said validation non-empty list fault A. But since it's very common that people will, will use validations with non-empty lists, that's why the validation NEL exists. So now we're redefining, we're redefining some stuff that I've defined before. 
Um, you'll find this will be actually uh, is actually more brief because using applicatives, uh, using validations actually requires less code. You we're going to define a term as a validation of false or a. We're going to say an expression a to b is a Kleisley term a to b. We're going to define a diamond now just simply as a type. That's really the same thing as a tuple. We're going to say a binary operation is is this form right here. Now, notice that this means that the errors are still in the values here. I, I've sort of, I let this kind of as sort of an e exercise to, to the viewer. Um, okay, how, what could be done here to lift these also into, into the, the momentic type? So that's a good one to think about for, because right now these are actually defined as part of the, as part of the values in there. But this is how we're defining here for a binary operation. And we're going to lift a binary operation by saying, OK, you pass in a function from term A diamond term A to term B into a Kleisley term, term A diamond term B. And then uh, you know, pass a function to that. So that's, that's what this does. And the definitions, so we're doing things a little differently. We're saying, OK, an adapter has, a, has some, here's an error condition, the field doesn't exist. We're saying our source is a map, our key is a string. Um, we have a reader for a string, a reader for an integer, and you see it's really straightforward code there. You're just saying, okay, you have some value coming in here, convert it to a string and say success NEL. And these are, these are actually implicits that are defined, defined for you in Scala Z, and that, that'll return a uh, success validation uh, non-empty list. It's, so that's a validation analog to the disjunction minus V, okay? It's success, or, or sorry, V minus. Sorry, I got it backwards. So that's a success. Int reader now takes, uh, it's, it's going to parse the integer. But if that fails, oh, by the way, parse int, that's another nice thing built into Scala Z. That's, that's actually, what that'll do is it'll try to do the it'll try to do the parse, and if it fails, instead of just blowing up with an exception, it'll return a disjunction, which you can handle here. And you can say, okay, convert that to an expect, unexpected type, and we're going to wrap it into a non-empty list. So really, really short code here, starting to use applicatives, uh, and you know, so, sort of dig dig a bit deeper into the the Scala Z tool set. And now we're going to have a read here where we say, okay, we're going to read uh, some key value from this map. And that's literally, OK, you got the source, you read the key from it. And we're going to map it to, map it to this, this, this reader right here. So it's just going to be like however. That's basically our, our um, depending on if it's going to be integer or string, you could have more types here. And then if, if it's not able to retrieve it, then OK, field doesn't exist. It maps it to that. And that's a failure NEL. OK? So does this make sense to folks? OK. And now we're going to define our library, it's, which is actually, it's, in some ways it's more complicated than the other library, but in some ways it's actually a little bit more elegant. Um, what we're doing, I'll, I'll, I'll show this part and show that in a moment. Uh, well, first I'll say, okay, you have your trait num numeric operations, add, minus, and division. And the reason why I have two type parameters here is because I'm saying, okay, for add and minus, it's the same. You have you add two in, so you get an int back. Um, I'm I'm excluding the possibility of memory overflows where you have like an integer that's so big that it's almost gonna. I'm, I'm excluding the, th those cases, but sort of simplicity here. Um, but for division, you're you know you're gonna end up with you know you have you have two integers. You know you represent the result as a as a double. So that's why you have like the 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 b use right here. So that that explains that. And we're going to find integer operations and say, OK, add is we're going to lift this binary operation. And here's the, there's lots of clever names for this guy. Um, I've heard some folks, I, I, I know someone who refers to the Cinnabon operator. I've heard people refer to it as a TIE fighter operator. Um, I don't know if anybody has like a clever name for it. <laughs> I mean, there's all kinds of names. You could think of it like a plate with like a knife and fork on both sides. I don't know. All kinds of, uh, but well, all that does is this is a, you have a function that takes in left and right values, and this is applicative that actually, that actually combines those. 
and or actually I should say it, it splits these apart and it says, okay, we're gonna add these two together right here. So, <clears throat> so for addition and subtraction are defined like that. Division, it's different. It's, it's, that one's interesting because it could return an error condition. That's why I define this little handy closed division function right here, where it takes a division, the actual division happens there, and you're passing in L and R here. But what it's doing up here is it's actually the, the tuple, this is a uh, it's built in the Scala Z, where you're actually combining uh, both the left and right. And from here, you actually form a validation here, okay? And that goes in T. And then you go here and you're gonna do a match right here. And then what happens there is you say, okay, um, this is, I'm, I'm basically pulling apart, because right, right here you're actually not expressing anything in form of validations or non-validations. You're referring to the actual raw values. But we need to pull it apart and actually refer to, we, we may actually have a failure or success here. So that's what, why this, this function exists here. And this is actually how you do that. And this will return, this will return the validation as a, as a result here. This gets lifted up into a binary operation and you have a closed division. And that's actually what you have right here. So is that, does that make sense? All right. So as you see, that's, that's simpler and, and we're actually pretty close to the end of this definition using, uh, using uh, uh, validations. You have, you get to define your, your, your syntax, which is you know, the actual operators in the language. And it's just literally, you're defining Kleisley's here. You're using different operations, minus division, applying it to both, uh, and saying, okay, you have a left and right, and you're applying the source to each of those as functions. And then that, that, that way it actually could compute. And, and actually errors are combined, are actually, we're, we're, allow, we're using validations to do the heavy lifting of combining all the error messages. Uh, or error conditions, if there are any. And if there aren't any, it'll just be computing the value. And this is, and this is all, this is all done because you know we're once again we're using the validation is actually the monad within the uh, within the Kleisley, because um, that's that's what term is. The term is actually a validation. So you can see defining the operations here is actually pretty pretty straightforward. Right here is if you want to take the symbols themselves and actually and actually read them, you would, you know, this, this is using the read function, which I defined in the earlier slide. <laughs> all right, and that's actually, that's actually all the definition right there. So, um, so yeah, uh, some great resources I recommend taking a look at for learning more about Scala Z, and also the CATS library. I, uh, these, these would be some great resources to look at, and, so the CATS library is is actually it's a it's sort of like a, it's it's you can think of it as like Scala Z reimagined. It's a it's a fresh fresh take on uh, fresh take on implementing uh, uh, building sort of a category theory library. That's what CATS means, category theory for Scala. So it's 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 intended to be more and more approachable. Um, it, it, it doesn't have all the, f the features that you'll find in Scala Z, but the idea is to try to put the things that, the, the essentials together in sort of a more, more elegant way. That's kind of the idea behind CATS. Um, we actually have, at Verizon, we actually have committers um, on, for CATS and, and Scala Z as well. And I, I definitely, yeah, I highly recommend giving CATS a serious look. I mean, it's, it's reaching a point, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, it's the the test coverage is really impressive. I, I want to say seventy percent or maybe an eighty. I, I don't remember exactly, but it's it's got really impressive test coverage and and uh, there's like a, a, uh, you know coverage for making sure that the laws are enforced for all the different uh, all the different uh, monads and implicatives and such. Could you have written all of this in cats? Sorry. Could you have written all of this in cats? Um, I believe so. The I believe so, yeah. There might be some pieces that'd be a bit different. I mean, I honestly haven't used CATS yet. Um, I, I would say very likely, yeah. In fact, there's some features built into CATS that would have been really useful here, like where, I, where I'm dealing with the different, uh, uh, the different 
let's see, the different uh, data types, right? I have like integers and, uh, where is that slide? Right, right here, I have integer operations and, uh, I mean, if you wanted to find double operations, you would have to define like another one of these for double. CATS has like an algebra package that really, that has some really neat stuff that actually would help unify some of that. So that's probably one of the next things I'll actually look at, sort of like as another iteration on this code. So, so yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot in CATS I recommend taking a look at. I mean, a few, I mean, Scholar-Z obviously has more of a history, so there's a lot of libraries that are using that. So switching is, you know, it's a bit of a transition, but I'd say if you're starting with a fresh new project, I mean, CATS is definitely worth a look for sure. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, Kleisley has been added to it recently. Um, <laughs> the, one of the missions, or the, 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 the things that you won't get with CATS is uh, Scholar-Z task. And that's, that's something that's really, uh, that's really handy, and we actually use that a lot. Um, a lot at Verizon, so that's kind of like the one thing that's keeping us from using it internally. But um, there, there, there's work on having that implemented as sort of as a separate library from Scholar Z. So, so yeah, I recommend taking a look at these these uh, tutorials and and just looking at a lot. I mean, the way what, one of the ways to to learn a lot of this stuff is just looking at a lot of different t tutorials, composing them together. Obviously, Stack Overflow has a lot of uh, you know helpful posts on there as well. Um, just combine all those together, and you just try it. You, know, you, you just just experiment with it, and in, you know it, it helps you. You find some folks that have wor worked with these two to sort of to sort of pick their brain a bit too, and ask questions. And I mean, there's a lot of and there's a really a lot of exciting stuff to be learned um, in these libraries. And find as you as you use more as you use more um, of, the, of these. Uh, pure functional programming constructs in your code, you find that a lot of, a lot of your, what you're doing is you're, 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 you build like a core that's mostly purely, purely functional and any, anything outside of that would be sort of like what I refer to as the edge of world and that could be sort of handled separately from that. So you're trying to pull as much of your logic outside of that sort of uh, messy, uh, uh, you know, environment where you have the, you know, accidental complexity, pulling as much of that into your pure functional core so that once you do have to tackle those, those sort of, you know, annoying like, you know, deployment related issues, issues with like interfacing with other APIs and such, then at least you've, you've taken all your core logic and moved it away from that. So, so attacking these two beasts separately. So, so yeah, definitely take a look at these uh, resources. And yeah, once again, we are, we're, we are definitely hiring, we're looking, for you know, if this this sounds exciting to you, this type of stuff, then let me know. Um, and definitely check, take a look at this, the open source that we have. I mean, there's a lot of really, really interesting, uh, really interesting projects there. That, yeah. So, so any any more questions? Anyone? Yeah. Oh yes. What, sorry, I didn't hear. Do you have an example repository where you go through the examples you have with actual code examples in their repository? Yes, so uh, let's see. So I have, so some of this code I have in like my, my repo, so the presentation, for the code for the presentations in there, you might find that there. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna see like how I get the slides available. Say, so but here can can check out the slides of this too. Um, is that does that answer your question? Yeah. So, yeah. So I mean this. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe it's like post in like meetup comments or something. Yeah. So any any more questions? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you, you're making great use of FP in, in a real business environment. So I have kind of a, yeah. just a general question for you mm -hmm. about kind of that middle zone between there's the messy edge way over here, and I understand right. that. And, the, and you have these kind of way at the core, you have your central kind of building blocks like this. Yes. But there's this huge zone in the middle that I struggle with. It's not quite either of those. It, 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 you're talking about a lot of just kind of munging through the business rules and transformations and 
you know, yeah. way bigger than just these little building blocks. And this kind of, it reminds me of a problem that I identified years ago with C++, yeah. where the examples were so beautiful and so perfect if you're building a stack. Right. Well, but in the business world, we assume the stacks exist. And so, you know, how the features, the language features, translated in these larger concepts than just a, a DSL or just a, a parser or just a, you know, a new stack or, or you know, these kind of smaller data um, algorithms and constructs, that's the zone where I, I look at some of the code I'm writing right now and it's like, I know it could be more graceful, but should it all be abstracted up to, you know, just these beautiful applicatives and, and monad transformers and where's that zone? So so the way I see it is buried in, in that, I, I, I know what you're talking about, so he's, he's talking about the middle ground between where you have your, your core, where you can create a pure functional uh, system, if you will, quite easily, and then you have like the outside where you have uh, all the you know, sort of messy edge of world stuff. But in the middle there's a zone that's kind of a, uh, sort of a, sort of a, it's an area where it's a little bit unclear how to split these apart and to, to, uh, to, to you know, decompose the, the, the rules into the pieces that you actually pull into your functional core, right? Yeah, or, or you're dealing with constructs that are bigger than like building blocks. They're, they're, not, right. they're, they're bigger than bread box, but they're not like full systems. I, the way I would describe that is, I would say that buried within that, there. You you could pull these. You could actually take to put put a lot of this. Some of this, some of this is likely. You know, it's it's not as not as strongly typed. Not it can be difficult to express. You know, using these different category theory uh, constructs. But I'd say that you'd probably be surprised how much of it you can. And a lot of it really is a matter of just spending a lot of time. And, and believe me, it's when you're actually trying to apply using category theory, actually solving real problems that. That, that has this sort of inherent messiness in there. It's, the, the analogy I like to use is it's like, it's like the difference between driving a car from here to LA versus flying a 747. If you're driving a car, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm doing work, I'm turning, I'm not turning, and I get on the freeway here, and this is going, and going along. Whereas you get on the 747, you take off, it's like, okay, you're just looking around. It's like, you don't have a frame of reference, you, you, don't, you don't think anything's happening, but actually, a, a lot's happening. You're actually moving, you know you know, when it's like 800 miles an hour or something, you're moving you know, about the speed, you're moving at the speed of an airplane. And, and that's, that's actually what's really going on is you're working with these concepts, you're dealing with higher order problems. And you're trying to shape it, you're shaping your problem in a way that's in, in that context. So once you do, everything just, just, just fits together. And, and it's, it's really, it sounds like sort of a magical thing, but as you're working on it, it makes sense. You see how things are factored into these different pieces, and it, it just comes together. But it does take more time to do that, and it's it's there's there there's frustrate, frustration in the learning process, and because you know these concepts are are quite you know it's it's a different way of thinking. It's not it's not like you're the imperative world, where you're thinking in sort of a step-by-step -step fashion. No, it's, it's a bit more mathematical. You're, you're constructing expressions and building them off of each other using a lot of recursion. And, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's a mental shift and it, it takes a lot of, it takes a real dedication. And, but, but, but yeah, I, I, I do strongly believe that, you know, that middle ground can be totally, totally split apart where you have parts that, yeah, definitely this is your edge of the system where it's not, not as strongly typed, can be, you know, it's, it's kind of like the outside of your, your core. And then you have the parts where actually it goes in the core of your application. <sighs> yeah, so, oh, sorry, yeah? Okay, really the question, do you see advantage use a Glacely function over three monads? Because Excellent question. Yeah, so I, so I, I've actually, when I, when I was applying this to building a DSL, I was originally wanting to use a free monad. But it seemed that the Kleisley seemed to be a more proper representation. And I, I think one way to look at the difference between the two is a Kleisley, Kleisley composition, building Kleisleys, composing them together, that, that is sort of, that could be seen as like sort of a declarative process. You're, de you're defining your functions, you're composing them. Whereas a free monad, 
is it sort of unwraps that into a more imperative, and I mean imperative in a functional sense, because I mean, <laughs> if that makes any sense. I, so I mean, when I mean imperative in the functional sense, I mean, I mean, w like you look at a four comprehension, that's, that's how you're building a free monad, or a free monad interpreter, I should say. And what that does, that's just a, that's just a, a, a sort of syntactic sugar for a series of flat maps and a map at the end. So, so it's, it, it really fits itself towards problems where it's like you're, you're, you're actually trying to represent something that's inherently step by step, but do that in a functional way. And for like uh, building expressions, not really, I mean, X, X, you know, A to, A, you know, like X to the N plus Y to the N equals Z to the N, that's trying to represent the step by step way is kind of, you know, it doesn't quite fit. So that's why, that's why it kind of went towards Kleisley. Yes. Uh, they, they not used do you have any ideas, for example, how to send build expression over REST interface? Over so REST interface? This realize on some particular format. Well, Maybe there's... The free monad means if you need to send uh, expression over uh, some wire. You, you could certainly combine, I mean, you could have, like, your free monad generate Kleisley's. Um, I, I'm just sort of top of my head on the, how, how this would, I mean, I, I think, you, yeah, you, you, I mean, you could do that if you're like saying like your output of a free monad is like this constructed Kleisley maybe. Um, I don't know, that's sort of, sort of hand wavy, I know, but does that, that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> so any anything else or, yep? So is there any library that you know that, that is using uh, Kleisley? Um, oh, uh, well, at, as a DSL, this, so my use of Kleisley here, I, I haven't seen, I actually haven't seen Kleisley used for building a DSL. It just seemed like a good idea as I was constructing and it actually worked out really well. Um, and I'm using it for, you know, you know, processing some rather complex data. And it actually worked really well. Um, I, as I built this thing, as I found the bugs that I'm dealing with, it, 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 there's this project I work on that, that uses this at the core. I've had very few bugs in the core, but a lot more issues kind of on the outside, like just trying to, you know, it, 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 it actually, there's a, the, the spark comes into play here too, and there's like some other issue I've ran to there that, that, that really is kind of separate, like it's sort of that kind of edge of world. Um, but uh, yeah, to answer your question, there might, there might be some out there, I'm not really sure. I would say like a good, uh, sort of what inspired me to take a look at Kleisley beginning was the Funnel Project. Now it was before it was open source, but it's open source now so you can take a look at the, uh, you know, at uh, the um, GitHub page for, for on Q. They have, uh, they, you, you could actually take a look at them and see how Kleisley, I mean they're used all over the place in Funnel. Um, so I would definitely take a look at that. So, so are we good or? All right, cool. Thank you. There you go.